And this is an equation that gives the pressure difference between two fluid phases, and it's going to be useful when we talk about two fluid phases in a porous medium. But to motivate this, consider this arrangement. Consider we have a beaker of water, and then I dip into the water a very small glass tube. Now you're probably aware of what's going to happen. What's going to happen is the water's going to rise up the tube. It's the same as a tissue soaking up water. So the water will rise up the tube, and you're probably aware that if I were to blow this up, you'd actually get a fluid meniscus like this. The water is, is sort of attracted to the surface, which indeed it is. And let's just think about this, and let's make it a little bit more general. Let's call this phase one. Generically, that will be water. And then we'll have another phase that I can call phase two, and that could be air, it could be carbon dioxide, it could be oil. Now, you probably know that pressure varies with depth. So if I go down here, pressure increases as rho gh. If I go up, then the pressure in the water should decrease. So the pressure in the water here, at a height h, is lower than the air, because the air pressure, for instance, is just atmospheric. So there's a pressure difference, and in fact, the air is at a higher pressure than the water. The air here, which we're calling phase two, is bulging into phase one. There's a pressure difference between those two fluids. So how do we, how do we try and quantify that? What is that pressure difference? Well, we can look at this as conservation of energy. So imagine we've got phase two, and phase one. And then phase two moves to displace phase one. So imagine air pushing out water or carbon dioxide displacing water. Now a little bit of physics, if there is a pressure difference between the phases, the work done is PdV. Okay, so there's an increase in the pressure of phase one. So it's pressure, sorry, pressure phase two dV, that's an increase in volume, so there's an increase in volume here, and there's a decrease in the volume of phase one. So the work done is like this, and we can define what's called a capillary pressure, which is the pressure difference between the two phases. So this we call the capillary pressure. And in general, if we have two phases, it's normally the less dense phase, the pressure of the less dense phase, minus the pressure of the denser phase. So this can be written as PC dV. That's the work done. Well, what does that equal to? Well, by putting in work, I've created more of an interface between the two fluids. In previous videos, I've talked about the interfacial energy or the interfacial tension sigma which is an energy per unit area so if i put work in i can increase the surface energy this is the energy per unit area so the work done is going to be equal to sigma times the change in area so now the capillary pressure can be written as follows the interfacial tension times the change in area divided by the change in volume. So now let's look at this for a simple example and then we'll do the general case. So let's give a concrete example. Let's think of our beaker here and what we got is we're going to grow a sphere of phase two that's surrounded by phase one. So imagine this sphere is being blown out, so it gets bigger and bigger, and this sphere has a radius r, and then we think of increasing it just a small amount by an amount dr, okay? So we know that the capillary pressure, that is the difference in pressure between phase one and phase two, is the interfacial tension times dA dr. That's dA dV. I apologise. So, some elementary geometry to do this. What's the area of a sphere? 
you should know that the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, where r is the radius of the sphere, and the volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So now, just some uh, elementary mathematics. This can be written as sigma dA dr dr dv. So we just differentiate both of these with respect to r. So dA dr is 8 pi r. And dv dr, I'll do this quickly because it should be obvious. This is actually gives us the area here, 4 pi r squared. So our PC, we can write as sigma, dA dr is 8 pi r. And then we're dividing by dv dr. So it's 4 pi r squared. And we can see some things are going to cancel out here. All right. This gives us a 2. Pi's cancel. And we end with our final result, which is PC is 2 sigma. And then there's an r here, because this r cancelled with the r squared. So the capillary pressure of a spherical droplet is 2 sigma divided by r. And what we're going to do now is introduce the concept of curvature. So if I have a smooth line, or curve, you know that any point on that curve, here for instance, I can match a circle. It's not drawn very well, but this is a circle of radius r. And so this is the radius of curvature, and we can define a curvature, which I give the Greek symbol kappa to, which is 1 over that radius. In three dimensions, you can have a smooth surface, and hopefully it's sort of intuitively obvious that there are going to be two radii of curvature, one in one direction and actually another one, the two principal radii of curvature, in orthogonal directions, and we label those R1 and R2. And in this specific example of a sphere, you know that a sphere is curved in one direction and in exactly the same way in the other direction. So for a sphere, R1 and R2 were equal and they were both equal to the radius of the sphere R. But you can have different shapes and different curvatures. A classic example would be something that's shaped like a pear. So I'm going to draw possibly a rather poor picture of a pear here. All right. But if I were to slice a pear like that, it would be a circle. So it has one radius of curvature where the pear is bulging out into the air. But in the other direction, you have a different curvature where the air appears to be bulging into the pear. And in fact, the curvature there is negative. So don't worry about the fact that it's a radius and you can't get a negative radius. You can have a negative curvature. OK, so a pair has one curvature that's positive, one that's negative. A sphere has two equal curvatures. If you had a cylinder, for instance, it would have one curvature, which would be the radius of the cylinder when you sliced it, and it's a circular cross-section. But in the other direction, the, the radius of curvature is infinite. There is no curvature, so that would only have one curvature. So in this last part of the video, I'm going to derive the general form of the Young-Laplace equation. It's not that straightforward, but the idea is, as before, that the capillary pressure can be written as sigma, a change in area, divided by a change in volume. And we're going to do this for an arbitrary geometry. So imagine we have a small piece of interface, which in one direction has a radius of curvature r1, and is subtended by a small angle alpha. Then in the other direction, so of course I can't do this in three dimensions, but you imagine in the other direction that this is also like this, an angle beta, and this is your radius of curvature R2. And now we can uh, imagine this is a little piece of interface like this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the radius by a small amount. So both radii are going to increase by a small amount dr. Okay, so now I'm going to have a slightly larger 
region like this, like this. So I want to calculate the change in volume and the change in area as a result of a small change in this interface. So it's got two curvatures, they can be of uh, any value, and now I just slightly stretch, like slightly stretching a sheet. Well, the total area before I stretched it can be written, the area here is just alpha, beta, R1, R2, because this is alpha R1 times beta R2, and it's a sort of rectilinear shape. The change in volume, if we just increase everything by dr, is just this times dr. Now what about the change in area? Well, the change in area, that's the original area shown here. Of course, we have a new area, which is a plus dA. OK, so that's the change. Is just where I've increased the radii, R1 plus dr, R2 plus dr. And of course, we assume that dr is small, so I'm ignoring, going to ignore any terms in dr squared. And I've got a written here, so I can see that a plus dA is alpha, beta, R1, R2. And then I'm just going to take the terms that are linear in dr. So it's an alpha, beta, R1, dr, plus an alpha, beta, R2, dr. And then we can see we've got a here, and we've got a here. And that's going to cancel out here. OK. So my dA has just got these two dr terms. OK. And there's my dV. So now let's write my equation here. Sigma dA divided by dV. So dA is alpha beta. We got that in both cases. We got R1 plus R2 times dr. My dv, again, has an alpha beta, it has a dr, and it has an r1 times an r2. So again, some things are going to cancel out. The alpha betas cancel. The dr is a dummy, so that cancels. So I'm left with here a sigma r1 plus r2 over R1 times R2. And that can be written, and I'm going to write it out again here, so it's a little bit clearer. This is the general form of the Young-Laplace equation. You see this is 1 over R2, and then 1 over R1, and we would normally write it 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. So the capillary pressure, the pressure difference between two arbitrary phases, is the interfacial tension between those two phases, then multiplied by the sum of basically the two curvatures, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. So this can be written in an alternative form in terms of curvature, if you wish, sigma times the curvature in one direction plus the curvature in the other direction. And if it's a sphere, those two curvatures are the same and they're one over the radius. So that's why you get the two sigma over R. If you were to have a cylinder, you've only got one radius of curvature. So it would just be sigma over R. And if you had a pear shaped, you'd actually have those two curvatures with different signs. OK, that completes my description of the Young-Laplace equation. Thank you very much.